Good afternoon. As I've been making videos regularly again over the past few months, I realized that I have referred repeatedly to what I call the Harry Potter stage of language learning, but I haven't really explained what I meant by that. So that's the purpose of today's mini lecture is to explain that. And as I did in my longer lecture series that I gave over the past month and a half, I would like to try to make this as relevant as I can to all different kinds of language learners, first and foremost to those whom I call normal language learners, people who are not particularly interested in the foreign language learning process as such, but who find that they have a need to learn a particular language at a particular point in time and would like to succeed in that. And also to those who have various forms of what I call polyitis, uh, basically more or less obsessive compulsive need to collect language learning materials and use them to learn as many languages as possible. So I have information in this video that should be relevant to every type of learner. So uh, if you fit into any of those categories, please follow along with me to learn more about the Harry Potter stage of language learning, which is a magical haha, way of facilitating a transition that can sometimes be unfortunately difficult and frustrating and, and long. And that's the transition from using didactic materials, that is materials that have been specifically prepared to help foreign language learners learn a different language, um, to using authentic materials, that is materials that have not been prepared for that purpose, but they are rather for native speakers to get entertainment and enjoyment and education and, and information and knowledge out of, and you as a foreign language learner, you can use them for those same purposes, but you're also pressing them into use um, to continue your building your, your knowledge of the language as a foreign language. So this transition, um, as I said, um, can be a hard thing to affect, and um, it can can kind of try to get at it from one of basically two ways. One is what I call the scholastic experience, and that's when you learn a language as pretty much part of your, say, your college education. So you have maybe two years of language instruction and then another year or two of um, reading books in the language together with a professor and a number of other students in a class where you discuss them and, and you read them. And I bet any number of people over the course of my career as a college professor who have told me that they learned how to do that at some point in the past um, and regret the fact that somehow they let it slip, didn't practice it right away, and then when they tried to do it, uh, just quite hasn't worked the same way. And I think that there are a number of explanations for that. Uh, first and foremost, um, we professors take a lot of the onus of, of structuring the, the reading on, on, on our shoulders, so it's a lot easier when you have other people sort of directing the, the learning process than when you do it yourself. And then, frankly speaking, in the course of a semester, when you read a book or two, that's that's not very much, and we don't read the whole books, and it's, it's actually rather a slow pace, whereas when you're by yourself and you are trying to read on your own, um, you're probably going at a faster pace, maybe not really realizing it, um, and, and you haven't practiced right away. Um, so it's a harder thing to do. So here I would say that there's uh, the main challenge is that um, we educators, we've been using terms like lifelong learning as buzzwords for far too long without really putting them into practice. Well, what does that mean? Uh, there ought to be a way that when you learn how to do something like read a foreign language that you can sustain that ability, ideally, that would be something that you should be able to to do on your own all the time by yourself. But if it doesn't work it that way, it work out that way. And I would say in the majority of cases, it doesn't. If you learn how to read in a context where you're reading and discussing with a group of other people, um, if there were a way that you could continue reading in that context um, throughout your life, that would be ideal when able to keep this um, and improve this, this skill and then hopefully take it to the point when you, you can read it on your own. Now, this is a subject for another video that I will have coming up soon. I think that um, the modern contemporary world and changes that are going on have offered us exactly this possibility, which is kind of exciting. The other way that you can have this uh, experience is what I call the autodidactic experience. Those are for the um, one of the symptoms of polyitis, as I described it, is that um, you try to teach yourself languages. And so you get a collection of five or 10 or 15 different manuals for approaching a language. And you work your way through a good number of those and they give you different aspects and different perspectives on the language. And that's a good thing. Uh, but you'll come to a point when you say, gosh, I, I seem like I pretty much have learned it and I'm pretty good at these books and I know everything in here. Let me try to move on to the authentic materials. <clears throat> and 
um, you find that it's a, there's a big chasm between what you can do in the textbooks and what's out there in the real things. And it's, it's very tempting and comforting to say, well, I, I guess I need to study more and I'll go back to my textbooks. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to break away from that. It's comforting to return uh, and, and think that you're not up to the level. Whereas if you've gone through a number of them, you probably are. So the, the main challenge here is breaking away from your, your textbook collection. I have one bit of good news in all of this, anybody who doesn't know it. Um, when you have learned some related languages, this is not so much of a challenge anymore. I said this whole process of transitioning can be a difficult and frustrating one, but if you have done it with Spanish uh, and then you try to do it, say, with Italian, it is much, it's, it's not so bad. But uh, doing it with Spanish for the first time is hard. And if you do it with Spanish and then you try to do it with Russian, then it's still hard again. And so uh, other situations, when you don't have the experience and when you're trying to do it with non-related languages, this can be uh, quite the challenge. So basically, why is it a challenge? It, it comes down to the vocabulary. Um, again, I've made other videos about this. This is knowledge that's out there. Um, you, if you've gone through uh, the basic courses, be it you know in two or three years of college education or a, a pile of uh, autodidactic manuals, um, you should have your basic vocabulary down. You probably know three to five thousand words. And with three to five thousand words on this side of the vocabulary mountain, there's quite a lot that you can do. Um, probably one of the things you can enjoy most is, say, songs, because they've got so much repetition. You'll be able to sort of listen to music in, in language. You can probably watch movies or watch television or something with um, not too much difficulty. Uh, there are probably subtitles that you can turn on, uh, and you have visual cues and effects also coming in. And importantly, uh, like songs, which are obviously extremely short, uh, movies are also short, generally 90 minutes, an hour, two hours. Um, and this is um, the, you can keep a thread going even if you do not understand everything that's, that's going on with something that's relatively short. That's true of the next couple of things that you can do also as well. Um, reading newspaper and journal articles because these are current events. You're probably aware of what's going on anyway. You have a lot of context and um, the vocabulary for these is, is usually um, international in many cases and they are relatively short. So short stories, those um, might be not a uh, current event type vocabulary or something, but precisely because they're short, say eight or 10 pages, um, you can read them at one sitting. And even if you don't get everything, there's not threads that you need to tie together and keep things uh, you know, a, a larger context in your mind. So these are things that it's probably possible for you to do. Um, you should probably be able to follow what I call lectures in your field, not necessarily academic lectures in, 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 in a school context, but I'm just talking about somebody giving a discourse about something that you know about and care about. If you're a doctor, it might be medicine, whereas for those of us who are not doctors, it would be really hard to follow. But if, if it's something that you are versed in, you can understand what people are talking about and then talking about talking. Um, you should definitely be able, um, once you've gone through a couple of years of, of college education or uh, again, a pile of textbooks for self-teaching, you should be able to have an everyday conversation um, talking about everyday life. When that conversation starts to get a bit more complicated, that's when you realize there's another side to the amount. When it's not just about, you know, what did you do today and what do you want to do this evening and, and what do you want to eat and, and things like that. When the conversation gets complex, when somebody's trying to convert you from Catholicism to communism and you want to resist that and you want to give a counter argument and and say why he should convert from, from, from communism to Catholicism. You need to have some solid reasoning, some cogent arguments. You need to be able to make some convincing points. You need to be able to say what you value and what you believe, what's important to you. Um, and that's something that you need a wider range of vocabulary to do. You'll also notice this when you go beyond, again, reading newspaper and journal articles and short stories, and you try to read a longer book whether this is a novel or whether it's an argumentative nonfiction book, um, something that's not just delivering points of facts and information, but actually making an argument, um, that's when you find that the length is going to trip you up. You might get the first chapter, but then the second chapter gets a bit confusing. And the third chapter, and there's just so many uh, uh, loose threads that you can't tie together. <clears throat> and it's because, again, um, the 
statistics and information out there that, again, everyday conversation, watching movies, you can do that with a vocabulary range of about the 5,000 most common words. Uh, but to read a, a, a standard novel, you need to know about 15,000 words. So that's a huge gap and a chasm. So that will bring you to a point where I hope that people who watch my channel, like what I have to say about language learning, that you already have it as a goal to learn, to, to read literature. That should be why you want to, one of your main reasons for wanting to learn the language. But if it isn't, if even if you um, aren't particularly interested in reading, when you come to the point of realizing, hey, to have that complex conversation and to be able to expand my vocabulary where I can have a really sophisticated understanding of, of, of whatever I want to hear or, or say, um, you'll just hit upon the fact that everybody concurs that extensive reading is really the only way to build your vocabulary beyond that five, six thousand range to 10,000, 12,000, 15,000. Um, that's really the only way is by reading and or these days listening to, to audio books. Um, so using reading as a tool uh, and or uh, hopefully uh, as a goal uh, are ways that, or, or what you're going to come to at this point when you're trying to transition from that didactic material to authentic materials. So one thing that you might reach for, ideally, uh, you would reach for quality native literature. If you've learned target language X, you should be reaching for material that's in that. If you learned Russian to read Dostoevsky and, and, and Turgenev and, 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 and Tolstoy, I mean, you might want to go straight for that. And for some people, that works. Um, but for many people, you find that precisely because that is the, the, the most dense, most complex, most sophisticated um, stuff that you can read, it's beyond you. You're still not anywhere near that level. Um, and so you can go to the opposite extreme and you say, well, let me swallow my pride. Uh, I might be, um, I might be 50 years old, but uh, I've only been learning this language for five years. So in this language, I'm a five-year-old. So I can read books that are written for a five-year-old. I've got a five-year-old's vocabulary about me. Um, so you can try to read children's books uh, and say, I want to learn in this natural way and, and, and this will give me cultural knowledge too and the like. Um, and again, sometimes this works, works for a while, works for some people. Um, but I think most people find ultimately that children's books are just um, too childish. You're not a child anymore, even if you are um, developmentally, uh, linguistically uh, at that level, um, your, your mind is not. And staying with things that are really too uh, puerile or juvenile is just not, not satisfying. It's not enough of a challenge. <clears throat> so uh, where people tend to end up is looking, okay, well, gosh, it's stuff that's really written for, you know, the, at the best native level is too hard. If stuff that's, if I try to go it and develop like a child into the language, that's not satisfying. Let me read some translations. Now I could read a translation, say from Russian into English or an English book translated into Russian. Um, but uh, if my goal is to read, um, widely, um, you might not know that by saying, well, you know, I, I read the, one book by this author and one book by that author, and uh, this author doesn't have all of her books or available as audiobooks, so I only read it and I didn't listen to it. Um, sort of going at looking at different authors or different translations, um, there's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> but what you are probably going to find is that it's taking you longer than you might have thought, longer than it seems reasonable for you to develop more and more vocabulary, to have higher and higher vocabulary stick. And the reason for that is what we call idiolect, or the, 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 the particular registers of a particular author for the higher vocabulary range. Everybody uses the same five, 6,000 words, but when we're talking about the 12 and the 15,000 words, um, people have different frequencies with which they use them. And so uh, author A has one set of words that he or she uses um, in, uh, in, 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 in his books. or and, and then so if you read one book, you might start to become familiar with those, but then you'll switch to author B and she'll be using a different set of words more frequently. And so you won't see author A set frequently enough for B's and then you move on to author C and without knowing it, um, you're not really staying with any one author long enough to uh, absorb their vocabulary. So let's look at what ideal transitional stage material would be. Ideal material for moving from that didactic textbook stuff to stuff that um, is intended for 
uh, native speakers to enjoy and, and, and profit from. Um, I would say the ideal stuff you would want to have is, since we're just talking about it, first and foremost, multiple books by a single author, lengthy books. Again, the purpose is to see those words that are in the 12,000, 15,000 range, to see them often enough that they stick. So it has to be a long book and it has to be books by the, the, by the same author so that they stay with that same range. Um, I would say ideally, um, again, if, if stuff for adults is too, requires too much cultural knowledge and sophistication and stuff for children is too childish, stuff that's written for teenagers, the young adult level is a good place to start. And then ideally, um, it would be really nice if these books would, you're going to read multiple works. If you're going to be developing your language skills, just as the person is developing, um, if the books could get more difficult, more sophisticated, longer, uh, as you read a series, that would really be ideal. Um, and then uh, definitely, if you're using this as language pressing authentic material as language into, into use as language learning material, you want it to be available in both print and as audiobook. Um, so you can both listen to it and read it, not just do one or the other. And then if you have this polyitis condition, um, if you can do this with one language, uh, you can use the same material in another language even more easily. You want it to be something that's available in multiple languages. So when I think about these ideal sort of set of things that you would want to have and use, for making this transition from didactic to authentic materials, um, there actually are not very many things that meet all these criteria. There are other popular series out there, um, I don't know, that are for young adults, uh, and there are multiple volumes, so the Chronicles of Narnia, or I don't know, the Hunger Games, or Divergent series, something like that. Um, but they don't, these books don't get more difficult and sophisticated as they go along. They're all pretty much at the same level. And I don't know, that they are all uh, available in print and audiobooks in multiple languages. So it's almost as if J.K. Rowling came along and created Harry Potter series uh, for this whole purpose. Um, in case you don't know the numbers, there are seven volumes in the Harry Potter series, and that's a total of about 4,000 pages of text. When that's read out as an audiobook, that's usually about 150 hours in any given language of, of listening to this text. And supposedly, um, these are now available in some 80 odd languages. It's not to say that all seven volumes are available, both book and print in all 80 languages, but um, I'm an American speaking probably to a mainly American or European audience. Most of the languages that um, you're um, probably going to be interested in, not Impur, but um, other languages, um, the main European languages, Middle Eastern languages, um, East Asian languages, um, these probably might have to dig a little bit, but you can probably get all this material in all of these languages. <clears throat> so the Harry Potter stage, then you come to it and you're going to start using this material. So um, basically, I don't know if this is really classic children's literature. It's, it's too recent. It's only like 20 years old, right? I mean, it takes about 100 years to decide whether Time, time winnows out and says, is this really something people are going to still think is, is classic, good, worthwhile reading stuff 100 years from now? I don't know. Um, nobody knows. But I do believe that there's really nothing like it out there in terms of a language learning resource, apart from the New Testament, which, which we've talked about as you know, something that's widely available in, in many forms, uh, something that's available at, in, in this length, this depth and this variety of languages uh, and ways that it can be used, this is really kind of a unique language learning resource out there. So um, that's why I talk about the Harry Potter stage. Um, you can basically use the series as a low, high intermediate or low advanced, the way you would use an SMEL or a linguaphone course, more like the latter, because you have one book that's the, the translation, another book that's the target language, in the audio in the target language, but you can use the, the series the same way you would use a similar language. The difference is <clears throat> um, you don't need to familiar yourself with that. You don't need to familiarize yourself with the contents of a textbook before you use it, but you do need to do that with here. You need to familiar yourself, familiarize yourself thoroughly with the content before you start to use it. So before you um, start using it uh, to, to, to learn the language, you need to read it thoroughly and in, in 
in English uh, a couple of times before you start out. But then beyond that, um, I have made uh, a video in, in the past about um, shadowing, different ways of shadowing, say. Um, there are multiple different ways you might do this. You might sometimes just listen to the target language, sometimes listen to the target language and read the English, sometimes listen and read the target, um, sometimes just read the target, many, many different ways um, that you can do this. However you have found useful for the basic learning process, you could probably continue that here. Um, most importantly though, um, as I did last week when, when I read the first chapter of uh, the first book of Latin aloud, I would say that reading aloud and trying to do so with narrative flair, uh, bring the story to life. Don't read in a flat monotone, but really try to listen to a good uh, audiobook narrator and try to do something similar. When you can bring a story to life as you read it is when you, you really understand it and can start to internalize that uh, vocabulary. So, um, Harry Potter series and polyitis. Now, um, this is um, for people who, again, have this um, share my compulsion to um, try to learn as many languages as we can, as well as we can. Uh, when you do that, you obviously have a challenge of a number of languages that you're balancing. So by reading the same chapter back to back in multiple languages, first and foremost, you are meeting that challenge. You've got a balancing act to do, a juggling act to maintain different languages. And By doing the chapters this way, you can do it in a comparative context because it's a narrative story and it's relatively long and complex. Um, it's not boring like reading the same very short textbook chapter. I'm more particularly when you tell yourself in your mind, hey, that's kind of interesting. I said it this way in that language. Now I'm saying it this way in this language. You use that, you bring that comparative context in there. Um, but more importantly uh, for polyitis, you can do what I described in the video that I made on advanced shadowing not too long ago and basically piggyback um, an essentially weaker language uh, on top of your stronger languages so that you can understand the weaker language before you are you, you, before you might be able to do so if you just did it. So for example, if you are a native English speaker and you have um, Follow the advice I've been giving forever to learn French and German first, and you're pretty strong in those. And you've also got, I don't know, um, Spanish and Swedish going, and those are okay, pretty good. Um, and then you're trying something more exotic like Arabic. So if you were just to go and read the book one, chapter one of Harry Potter in Arabic, uh, in English, and then try to do it in Arabic, that would probably be too hard for you, too much for you to follow, particularly in the in the audio version. But if you were to listen to slash read slash shadow um, it first in German, then in French, then in Spanish, then in Swedish, and then in Arabic, um, you would find that you could do it in Arabic uh, when you couldn't have done it in Arabic uh, on its own. So you can borrow the strength of these other languages to help you with, with the weaker language before you're, um, when you wouldn't be able to do so otherwise. So it's very useful for um, polyitis. Um, now for polyliteracy, um, I believe the stories that I've heard that the reason why the Harry Potter books are available in Latin and in ancient Greek is that the author herself felt that that would be a valuable thing to have and so she paid for that. She specifically went out and said I want my books, I want these available in, in these languages and I guess she knew when it became a bestseller you know other countries people are going to do this on their own but um, she backed this. And I suppose beyond that, the reason why Latin has two and Greek has one is probably the first Latin volume sold very well. Um, and so it was seemed people wanted a second one, but that probably didn't sell quite as well, nor did the, the Greek. Um, and so uh, I think that uh, those of us who are interested in these ancient languages for polyliteracy, uh, maybe we still have a shot. Christmas is coming. Let's go out and buy uh, all the uh, ancient Greek and Latin um, books that we can so that this gets reported back to her and she'll see fit to um, finance um, some further versions of them. So if they're available in the, the other volumes uh, and perhaps in other languages, who knows um, if we put out uh, feelers or calls for this, because as I uh, explained in my introduction, written introduction to the uh, video that I made of, of me reading the, the Latin <clears throat> uh, chapter one, I, I really think that 
re rather than learning these dead languages as dead languages, if you can also learn to read and hear them and appreciate them by hearing contemporary stories, stories that you know really well, sort of made through that vehicle, it makes it so much easier to approach them as living languages and to have something to sub vocalize and understand while, while you read them. So ideally, these should be um, available, uh, not just in, in print, but also um, in audio. So again, uh, I think that there's hope to get uh, more of these out there uh, if we um, all put out a, a call and a cry for it. So I also hope that this video uh, provided some useful and interesting information to you. So I thank you for listening and I will talk to you again next time. Goodbye.